Anime News Network cannot keep themselves out of drama because once again they have found themselves headfirst into the mud because they have upset the anime and manga community at large. And you're probably wondering to yourself, why? Why is the anime and manga community upset? Well, it is because they interviewed the actual manga author of Deliciousness in Dungeon, a series that definitely has become a lot more popular as of late. When it was airing last anime season, it was starting to make a lot of waves, a lot of people were starting to talk about it. I could not go anywhere on the internet without seeing some form of conversation focusing on the story. It was basically, you know, something that really just blew up, it blew up out of nowhere, and I feel like the reason why a lot of people really gravitated towards that, now there is no confirmation of this, but I have a feeling the reason why a lot of people gravitated towards it is thanks to Free Ren. With, with Free Ren coming to a close relatively recently as well, and a lot of people loving it, they obviously were searching and seeking for something in a somewhat similar fashion, something probably in a traditional fantasy setting, and that's exactly what Deliciousness in Dungeon is. Now, obviously, there's some very core differences because of the themes and what the story is about, but obviously, it does tick some of those check marks of people wanting a traditional fantasy instead of reincarnated or transported, you get the mumbo jumbo. So, getting into actually the point of this interview that Anime News Network posted earlier this morning, basically they had a chance to really dive into the headspace of the offer, which is a privilege that many would love to have. Like, you're not going to tell me, as like an anime fan, manga fan, light novel fan, whatever type of fan of certain stories, that you don't wish sometimes to yourself when you're sitting alone or whatever, and you think like, I wish I could talk to the author and ask a question about maybe, why did a character do this? You know, what would they do with the story? Or, you know, what inspired them to make these characters or whatever, this theme and story? You know, there's a lot of questions you could ask yourself and ask the author if you were given the chance. And so obviously, an interview like this definitely would would get a lot of attention, especially since it's focusing on an offer that has definitely become a lot more popular as of late. So getting into the actual interview, the reason why there is some drama and controversy around it is because it is a very, I don't know the proper word to describe it, but I feel like there is a disconnect between the interviewer and the actual offer within this interview, because it's like, it seems like the whoever was interviewing, you know, the offer here, they wanted to kind of ask questions that Twitter normally asks, like the, the headcanon and Twitter arguments and drama, instead of asking kind of, in my personal opinion, you can feel free to disagree with me, but you know, actual legitimate questions, like, you know, oh, you know, what caused you to really sit down and write a story like, you know, Deliciousness in Dungeon? You know, was it one day you were looking at food and you wanted to make something like that? You know, why is it set in a fantasy world? You know, there's a lot of questions you can ask, you know, what do they want to work on next after, you know, Deliciousness in Dungeon? You know, what what do they have planned for different stories in the future, etc.? There's a lot of questions, but instead of asking those type of questions, and the interview, more or less, does start off relatively simple and seems okay, but then it starts diving into asking if Lylos is autistic, or if the dwarf character is meant to have so much fan service around him, or, you know, talking about, you know, how there is a Yuri relationship, when in reality there isn't, it more or less was just never there, but a lot of people's headcanon believed it was there, and so let's just, let's dive headfirst into this. So let's get into the dwarf fan service, because this is definitely something I heard a lot about, a a lot of people were talking about when, you know, this episode and, you know, a lot of episodes focusing on him came out where he was just basically in his underwear. The author kind of talks about this. So let's, you know, let's read this. So the question is, in both the anime and manga adaptations, most of the series' fan service comes from peeks at Senshi's underwear. In the spirit of this, could you describe Senshi's sex appeal. This is what the interviewer asked the offer, and the offer responded, so the term fan service feels a little off to me, but I have seen people talking about Senshi's sex appeal. The reason I came up with this idea for showing Senshi in his underwear is that when I was little, I used to have, I used to live in this city where there was an old man hanging his laundry while just wearing underwear. 
it was just awkward for me, and I really did not want to look at him, but from his perspective, he really didn't care. He didn't care what other people thought. I found that vibe interesting. So, Senshi is a similar type of person who really doesn't care what other people think about him. Lylos is probably more like me and feels a little bit awkward looking at other people in just their underwear. But I thought this vibe was really funny and interesting. That's why I drew Senshi that way. So, basically, the reason why Senshi, you know, is always in underwear in certain scenes is not because it's meant to be for fan service reasons. It, in general, the actual main premise of it was that the author, which is a woman, by the way, was very uncomfortable with this old man in underwear in her childhood, and she took inspiration to put a character or a person like that in her story, and it's like, you know, his personality obviously doesn't care what people think about and how they view him, but obviously it's very awkward and weird. And so that is the origin story of Senshi, and so basically denying the fact that there is no fan service, you know, it was not intentionally meant to be fan service, pretty much crushing a lot of, like, you know, I guess of the community that was hyping up Senshi, you know, in the story of Delicious in Dungeon for even making a character like him. You know there's a lot of people upset just with the answer to this question. Now, once that is said and done, the next question literally right after the offer clarifies that, you know, Senshi is not meant to be for fan service. the interviewer asks, Senshi is rather handsome, though, isn't he? He has a really nice hair and a full beard, and the offer kind of skirts around the question and just says dwarfs are cool and it's just like it's very clear at this point within the interview most likely the offer is feeling a little bit uncomfortable with these questions and basically deflecting them trying to deflect them and say i just like dwarfs instead of really commenting on if he's handsome or supposed to be sexy or whatever like that and it's just like it's clear that the interviewer could not catch a hint after just these this question alone. But going even further down, we have another big one that just comes into play. We have basically the, you know, the interviewer asking about the relationship between two female characters and how there is a lot of headcanon going on in the community, especially on Twitter, that these two characters were clearly going out. They're, they're definitely going out, they're definitely a pair, they're going to be good together, etc. But basically the author said this, when I draw my manga, I try to develop it differently than the fans' expectations. If I care too much about how the fans will react, I think the story might become less fun or interesting. So I try not to think too much about how readers will react. In general, I'll just leave the reader's imagination like how they react or how they conceive or conceive my manga. Basically, what the offer said is, is that... Uh, I write my series how I want to write my series, I don't write it thanks to people's headcanons or theories, etc. I write what I want to write, and pretty much, once again, skirted around the conversation of, you know, two female characters being in a lesbian relationship with each other, and pretty much saying, nah, she she didn't write that, it was not intentional, but she's like, if you want to believe that, go for it, but overall, it's very clear that the author said, no, I, I don't write those characters to be a pair. Now this next one is a very big bombshell, and the reason for that is because I saw a lot of drama around this topic when it comes to Lylos and him being autistic. I remember seeing people basically say, if you think Lylos is not autistic, you're like sexist, you're transphobic, I've, I've seen people say you're racist, I, I, I've seen those discussions online, I've seen people say that to anyone that dare refute that Lylos is not autistic, like, you know, if you say he's not autistic, you're a bad person, you're evil, you're a vile entity, so to speak, I've seen people say that on social media, but the offer comes out and basically says, and you know what, before I even put words in the offer's mouth, let me just read the question, and then I'll, you know, say what she said. A lot of fans had a strong reaction to Lilos and Toshiro's con confrontation with one another. Quite a few fans on social media seemed to relate to Lilos' difficulty with reading social cues and related to it to their own experiences on the autism spectrum. Did you envision Lilos as an autistic uh, as autistic when conceiving his character? How would you describe the friction between Lilos and Toshiro? And the author responds with this. So, my understanding is Lylos is a really normal person. There's nothing special, and everyone can relate to a person like him. I also relate to him. So, I don't think I'm writing anything special regarding to Lylos. That's why I think people can relate to or appreciate him. Some people might say Lylos is a bit, a little bit autistic, but uh, Shiro has his own difficulties. 
everyone has their individual problems. It's not just Lylos or Shiro. The problem or the problems are mutual. We always need to try to understand and learn from each other. Sometimes you might hurt another person, but that's the process we need to understand other people. So pretty much the offer, once again, skirted around the question, kind of deflected a little bit, but more or less said no. Lylos is not autistic. He's a normal person. He's basically like a salaryman and everyday man that goes to work etc and the offer even says that yeah they relate to him a lot he's normal there was never any intentions to make him autistic that was never the plan that's not what he is that was never in their mind and so this the headcanon people have been building up for the last few months just came crumbling down with this answer from the offer and you already see people actually and i'm going to show it here seeing people already saying they know better than the offer does and that they know better about the story and th this is literally what this person says to this article I'm beginning to see a pattern here. Picky Eater thinks the very much if unintentionally autistic coded character is just very relatable, and now I'm not saying she is, but considering how many women never get diagnosed and how bad Japan is with these things, it's possible. So basically, you have individuals now online saying thanks to this interview that was made, that the author is autistic, just doesn't know they're autistic, they're not diagnosed, and it's just like they act like they know better than the author themselves, or they know the world better, and the, what they believe in is way more important than what the author actually has written and actually has said to confirm. It's just like, I absolutely hate stuff like this, and it's just like, it feeds into this toxicity, and it's just such a shameful interview by Anime News Network to really feed into just this, uh, this Twitter drama questions. It's like, look here, th there's just a lot of unhinged people on Twitter. There is. I made videos countlessly talking about it. It's basically a content farm at this point. But it's just like, seeing how they answer, or they ask questions to the offer that isn't, let's be honest, really important whatsoever, and there is just such a disconnect between the offer and the interviewer, it's disappointing, man, because it's like there is so many potential possibilities to ask some really crazy and great questions here, like about the world building, etc., but obviously, you know, the interviewer squandered that, didn't really even ask stuff about that, they just wanted to confirm their own headcanons about lesbian relationships, autistic coded characters, and, you know, the man service that, you know, Senshi has. It's just like, bro, it's very clear you're making the offer uncomfortable with this interview, and I just, I don't know what else to say, man. But I'll leave it at that, um... What's your thoughts? Do you think I'm overreacting? Do you think I'm reading too much into this? Do you think that, uh, you know, the people of Twitter know better than the offer and they know what is right and what is autistic coded? Or do you think that the offer's word is law? You know, let me know in the comments below because if we're on this topic, it's the same debate that always gets around with Yamato and how people say, oh, Yamato is a so-and-so, you know, a guy, when Oda has straight up clarified that uh, Yamato is a woman. He's literally confirmed this. You know, what's your thoughts on these debates? Do you think that the uh, readers on Twitter know better than these offers? Let me know in the comments below. But with that, be safe, stay healthy. Chibi out.